So, um, just to start out, well, I'm Jake Zarley from Selective Insurance. I'm part of the Safety Management Department. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 18 years now, and uh, I live in Washington, Illinois. I have two kids. I got a 12-year-old daughter, 10-year-old son, and um, yeah, they're they're an absolute blast. So I play hockey on the weekends, and I am a Leo. So just so everybody knows. So. Um, I went to Rolling Acres grade school growing up, and then I went to Richwoods High School. And during that time, there was always this mysterious figure that would walk the halls. He would appear in a classroom, and then he would disappear, or he would reappear in the gym, and then he would disappear again. But one way to know who and where this gentleman was, was the cha-ching, cha-ching, Wyatt Earp feel of his keys, his plethora of keys on the side of his hip that you could hear him coming from a mile away. And so as I grew up, I realized that this is actually the, the facility maintenance manager, right? And so what I discovered that this guy, he, he does a couple different things. He's able to keep the lights on in the facility. He keeps the heat rolling. And he keeps us um, as kids safe in the workplace. And so it's kind of come full circle where now I am presenting on keeping him safe when he used to watch me when I was a little kid. So it worked out pretty good. And so uh, some of the areas I want to cover today, just to give an idea of the exposures that he has in the workplace and solutions to those. So I want to keep this as light and uh, informative as possible for everyone. So if you share any stories or any ideas on, on how to keep uh, the facility manager safe, you know, go ahead and share. And I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. So top 10 reasons it's great to be a facilities manager. You always get the front, uh, they always get the best parking because you're at work first. Number nine, you get to answer questions like, so do you get the summers off? You know, number eight, you get to wear a hard hat, so that's pretty cool. Number seven, you get to use cool acronyms like ACBM, ATC, IPM. I made up some of those, but <laughs> they're, they're pretty cool. You can use some of those. So a lot of those are actually asbestos oriented and, and things like that, so it's pretty cool. Number six, you have the ultimate power because you can control the heat. Number five, you get called when there is a mouse in the trap. And number four, you get to carry the grandmaster key. And then number three, you get to take your kid back to her locker at nine o'clock because you have the grandmaster key. Number two, after your spouse complains about the way you clean, you can say, I'm responsible for keeping thousands of square feet of schools clean, so don't talk to me about cleaning, right? And number one, you get called for all of the hazmat cleanup. <laughs> I always love this picture of the gentleman standing around to the side and the other guys are wearing tanks. <laughs> always get a kick out of that. So what are the dangers? What are the, what are the exposures for this uh, particular line of work? So we got slips, trips, and falls. We got manual handling, we got electrocution, chemical, and outdoor exposure. So these guys are exposed to quite a bit. And so I just want to cover some of these ideas. So number one area that I'm running into is falls from elevation. This is an area where the facilities managers are getting up in ladders. They're climbing up on roofs. And these are the two areas that I have seen on a pretty regular basis where you have some injuries. So the results to the school costs. Uh, sprains and strains, broken bones, damage to the head, neck, and back. Lost time, uh, that, that's huge. Um, what happens is you'll have the facilities manager, he'll get injured, and then you don't have anybody able to replace him, so then you have to subcontract it out. Now you're talking about some major financial hardship for the school district. So that, that just kind of shows some of the um, I guess long-term effects to having him injured. So it, that's why it's so important to understand what are the exposures he's being exposed to and solutions to those. So what's interesting about the falls is that when you have a fall, the severity is high. So in insurance, we talk a lot about severity and frequency. So what we've discovered is that when you have a fall, there's, there's a high severity to it, but the frequency isn't as high for this type, type of industry. But what you run into is the falls from uh, everyone else. That would be teachers, custodians, food service. That's more frequent. The severity isn't as high, but you run into a lot of frequency there. And so that's one thing I'd like to cover today, too, is it isn't just have to be about the facilities manager. It can be about everyone, the staff. It can be um, even the students, even guests that arrive. So I'll branch off and cover some of those areas also. 
All right, so do these exist? Standard size, ladder. So I've been out to a couple of the schools, and I'll, see, I'll say, hey, can I see your ladder selection? And so he'll hey, maybe have a small step stool, and then a five foot, and that's about it. And I say, okay, you gotta have a 10 foot somewhere, right? And so he says, well, we make it work, and I say, ah, that's not gonna cut it. We gotta, we gotta get you some of the right tools for the job so you're not just make shifting some type of you know, chair, that kind of thing. So that's important. Inspecting the ladders, get rid of those old wood ones. We don't want those. Those things are garbage. Um, you can't paint them. I've seen stickers on them. You know, I've seen a variety of different things on those wood ladders, and you just got to get rid of them because they got to be inspected, they got to be looked at. So the wood ladders will crack. They'll start to um, actually just cause a lot of problems. Okay. And then the question to ask yourself with the fall exposures, roof work, do we even want our guy going up on the roof? Maybe it's best just to sub that out and just have the contractor take care of that and remove the exposure completely. Some areas of solution. So if you're going to have your contractor or your, uh, your facility guy going up on the roof, you want to make sure everything's clearly marked. You got to have a fall pre uh, prevention plan. You got to have fall arrest systems, warning lines, perimeter protection. There's a lot to it to make sure that when he's up there in that elevated area, he's properly protected. So. And then step ladders should not be used as straight ladders. I've seen this a couple times. I don't know. I, when I was younger, I was guilty. I usually, the, the ladders are designed to come out into a T, not designed just to lean up against. The feet aren't set up right for it. So I've seen this a couple times, so make sure the guys are not using those as straight ladders. So here's some everyday dangers. Look for entryways, right? The, the obvious things, snow, water coming in, slips and falls, things like that. Maintenance areas. This is where if you have the facility maintenance manager, he's working in the area, you want to make sure it's all caution tape off, block that area off from students and staff, you know, control it, make sure there's no tools on the ground. I've seen several injuries from someone tripping and falling on equipment that maybe was just left there, okay? And then using furniture to reach, your, reach high areas, you want to try to mitigate that exposure as fast as you can. Some other solutions. Classroom exposure, so make sure the classroom is well organized in a way that allows uh, the facility manager, teachers, students to walk freely within the classroom so there isn't any trip. Formal slip shoes, so this, this is kind of interesting. A lot of, a lot of schools don't think of utilizing the right type of shoe for the exposure. So you got housekeeping and you got the facility guys having to go into maybe the bathroom a lot, clean up the slips and falls. So maybe getting him a, a different type of shoe that would provide better friction and, and less slippage, you know, so requiring a, a different type of shoe policy. Making sure cords on the ground, they're all taped down. You don't want those to be free and loose. Um, that, that adds a trip exposure. Believe it or not, paper towels, make sure that if there is a spill, the teacher or the facilities manager, they have the equipment to take care of the exposure right then and there, you know, rather than them running around trying to find it and then the spill just you know, continues to hang out for other people to slip and fall on. So warning cones, housekeeping, and then proper slip flooring protection. So there's a lot of other areas that you can try to cover in that. So manual handling. This is where we, we run into a lot of shoulder, back injuries, things like that. So leading back injury risk factors, poor posture, physical uh, condition, and then incorrect lifting. Okay, cardinal rule. If it's too heavy, get help. Too many times I've, I've seen a, a gentleman will want to try to lift a particular object and he doesn't want to take the time to go, to go get help, things like that. So I try to push for a lot of the guys, hey, get help if you need it, okay? It's really very, very important. So to do or not to do is the question. Twisting and bending, reduce the twisting and bending associated with lifts and moving material, okay? What do you think is better, pushing or pulling? What do you guys think? Pushing, I'm hearing some pushing. And actually, you're, you're both right. It can be pushing and pulling. It all depends on the situation you're running into. So there's benefits to both. Uh, if you're pushing, then you can see where you're going using more of your legs. If you're pulling, a lot of times I see people will pull back this way, then you're going to cause a shoulder injury um, that way. If you're pulling, then you can't see what's behind you. But in certain cases, you just have to use a dolly pulling maybe a device up the stairs. So you're gonna go, you're gonna pull it backwards. So it's always best to evaluate what you're gonna do when you go to, to pull that device. And I have a tendency to like the pushing. 
Um, and I think you run into that more frequently than you do the polling. So I would definitely lean toward the fact that pushing is probably the, the, the one that you run into the most often. Watch the frequency. Make sure that the guys aren't having to do a lot of lifting on a pretty regular basis. Maybe they're doing some yard work outside and they're going to be lifting some material for hours on end. Make sure you reduce that frequency. Have them take breaks. Uh, do some stretching, things like that. Okay? And then again, team lifting is huge. You know, whenever they, they have a heavy load, make sure we cover that. Mechanical aids, that would be dollies, that would be carts, that would be um, any kind of uh, appliance dolly, some of the beefier ones. Utilize those. So, some other solutions to that. Don't store heavier items up high. Try to get a mid-range, okay? Reduce that reaching exposure. Sometimes I, I've run into a couple of facilities where we're able to talk to the vendors and whatever material they're delivering, we can actually get them to reduce the load. So if you have an 80 pound load, we can reduce it down to 40. And so the guys then, uh, it, it just removes that factor all out. So you don't have to maybe get help for those heavier lifts, we can just reduce it right away. Okay, then training, okay. Two man lifts, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing that because it's a, it's a cardinal rule. And so trash can dollies, that's where you have the trash cans and it has the wheels on the bottom of them. So they're not dragging the garbage cans around. Those are very helpful. And then proper lifting techniques. Get close to the object. Get a firm footing. Bend the knees. I think a lot of everybody, pre, this has been preached quite a bit. I bet a lot of people already know a lot of this. But keep your back straight. Lift with your legs. Keep the low close. But one thing a lot of people miss is where the eyes go. Because where the eyes go is where the head goes. And where the head goes, the back goes. Okay? So the biggest thing is looking. I, I, in the books, they say to look forward. I say even looking up because then it, it just takes that, that factor away as far as your head heading down and, and, and then you're, you're putting too much pressure on your back. Does that make sense? Now we're getting into the electrocution, so who knows what lockout tagout is? Anybody know? Everybody's got a familiarization over that? Okay, good, good. So basically what you want to do is when you have a particular device or a piece of equipment, that piece of equipment is going to have kinetic or static energy associated with it. And what we want to do is we want to take that energy and we want to lock it out. We want to make sure that when anyone's working on a piece of equipment that they're not going to have that energy get activated and it's going to go through them and they're going to have an injury. So there's a couple ways you can lock it out. That's a physical lockout where you can't turn on a panel, you can't turn on a machine. Um, just any type, of, any type of device that would prevent someone else from turning on that machine while the facilities manager is working on it. If you can't do that, the next step is, is you tag it. You put a, a little tag on there that says, do not operate, do not turn on, and even put a signature on there saying who you are. So I've had some people say, well, I don't know who locked this out. I need to find out who did this because I need to turn it on or I need to remove it, and they can go find out who it was, that kind of thing. So facilities, guys, you got boilers, electrical panels, you got some power tools. Those are pretty easy power tools. You just unplug it. It's pretty straightforward. But the key is, I was at a, a, when I was a safety director at a plant, I was walking through and there was a, uh, a machine that was being worked on by the maintenance guy. And so uh, I, I stopped there and I said, okay, I, I, I can't tell what's going on with this machine. It looks like it's being worked on, uh, but uh, you know, I, I wasn't 100% sure. So I called the facilities guy and I said, hey, what's up with this machine? What's going on? He said, oh yeah, yeah, I had to run and get a part for it real quick. And I said, well, there's no blackout tag out for it. You know, I, I don't know if I can use this or not. And he said, no, no, I'll bring it all over, no problem. So another employee comes walking up and says, hey, I need to make this particular part. I need to cut this or whatever. And I said, well, you can't use this. It's actually shut down. And so by, by figuring that out, I hopefully had prevented an injury because he was going to use this machine that may have caused an injury for him. And so that's just an example of, you know, we need to make sure that even if the machine is even unplugged, tag it and say that this can't be used because someone could then just plug it in and use it, that kind of thing. Make sure we get all exposed wires put away in their little electrical boxes. Make sure those are all taken care of. Frayed electrical cords. I've seen a lot of guys, well, they'll just snip it and then they'll put a new plug on it. I say just get rid of it. Just replace it, get a newer one. Uh, electrical cords are being updated every day, you know, better insulation, things like that. Uh, using the fiberglass ladders, that helps with that. You know, you don't get rid of the wood ones, get rid of the aluminums, get the fiberglass. Okay. Now we run into the wonderful chemical world. So we got cleaning solvents, uh, we got paints, we got all sorts of myriad of things with regards to that. 
Now what's important here is, is having a procedure. Uh, too many times I've walked out into the facility and, and I've seen that, okay, what do you do if, if so-and-so spills this or you have to clean up this? Well, I'll just, I'll just go grab my rags and I'll do my thing. It's like, well, it, there's more to it than that. And that's where the safety data sheets come into play. Now you'll notice in the picture you have material safety data sheets. Several years ago, the United States decided to finally get along with the rest of the world and we formed the Global Harmonization System. And what this is, is basically we decided to get all the SDSs to match what the rest of the world is doing. And so uh, they, then the name changed to the SDS, all the information is going to be really similar, uh, pictures are going to be the same, so that helps a ton. So your facilities manager should have an understanding of where those are and how to read them. So when they do have to perform a cleanup, they know exactly what they have to do with regards to PPE, personal protective equipment, what they have to wear, what you shouldn't mix that particular item with, okay? Maybe you have a particular cleanup that is an acid and a base. Those should not mix, you know? So then uh, on top of that, the spill kits should have sand, acid neutralizers, caustic spill kits, flammable, and then mercury. Those are some of the items that you should have in place there. All right, now the outdoor exposures. So we got snow removal, right? Mowing, noise, heat and cold exposure, and then some fatigue that the guys are being exposed to. So when they're outside, PPE is pretty important. They gotta have goggles, hearing protection. You know, you, if you're not wearing hearing protection during mowing, you're actually uh, experiencing hearing damage. Um, it's, it's at a high, high level. It's over the 85 PSI. And so you got gloves, shoes, pants. Um, I, was, I was driving through my neighborhood the other day and I saw a gentleman welding without any, sh welding, I'm sorry, mowing without any shoes on. He was just in his bare feet. I was just, oh my goodness, this is crazy. So uh, always check the mower, making sure that all the proper safety devices are where they should be. Um, stay away from the, the discharge openings, right? Making sure those are properly covered. And then don't mow on slopes, you know. If you're gonna have a, I've seen guys where they're, they're mowing on, you know, on a rider and they're at a heavy angle and I just, I'm holding my breath the whole entire time. I just, I, I just, it freaks me out a little bit. So if they have to, you know, get a smaller mower, you know, where they, they can, it's more manageable and, and there isn't that tip over exposure associated with the riders, okay? And believe it or not, a lot of guys, they, they forget to disconnect the spark plug when they're working on it. You know, it can actually cause the mower or the blades to spin. So that's, that's, that's something I see every now and then when I'm walking through maybe the machine shop. And then starting the mowers inside, making sure they have carbon monoxide exposure and they have an understanding of that and what, what that entails, okay? And make sure they're, they're cutting at a slow, careful manner. Too many times I've been outside and I see the, he's flying through the, through, the, uh, through the area near the playground. I mean, he's, just, he's moving, so he needs to slow down, take his time. And then we have the heat exposures and cold exposures. And a lot of this is just to give an understanding of of the symptoms associated with it. Some, too many people kind of take this a little too lightly. And so when you got heat exhaustion, you got nausea, vomiting, the rapid pulse, lots of sweating, not just normal, but really sweating. And then when you start to get into the other realm, when you're no longer sweating, you got dry skin, confusion, fainting, and blurred speech. Those are the areas to watch out for that heat stroke. Frostbite's pretty straightforward. I think everybody understands that when you got the tingling and itching. But once you pass that tingling and itching, then you're starting in, uh, to get into that deep frostbite area. And that's, that's where you need to be very, very careful. Hyperthermia, same type of thing where you got the fatigue, clumsy movements. People are getting a little more confused, not too sure what's going on. So those are the symptoms to watch out for when they're outside. Some other ideas to control with the heat exposure. Don't work in a heat wave, okay? If it's, if it's out of the ordinary or if the temperatures are, are extremely high for out of season, just, they shouldn't be doing it. They shouldn't be out there, okay? If you have someone new that's uh, maybe a new hire that doesn't have a lot of experience of being outside, have them take more frequented breaks, right? Okay, heat-related symptoms um, the day before. So make sure if, if they've had any of these symptoms the day before, they probably shouldn't be working the next day. They need another day of recovery, that's for sure. Now, it says four cups of water every hour. That, that's recommended. Um, I, I think it all just depends. Um, if you're out on a, an extremely hot day, I've drank that much water easily, no problem. 
but there are other days where you just don't need to drink quite as much. But the key, I think, is, is making sure you're always drinking, not just four cups all at once. You should always maybe take a drink every 15, 20 minutes, every half an hour, you know, even if you're not thirsty, okay? Wearing light colored, breathable, loose clothing, nothing, nothing tight, nothing dark. You know, make sure everybody's just, just taking those proper precautions. Then you got the cold exposures, okay? Layering is the best way. Making sure everything's covered, taking frequent breaks, and actually drinking fluids. I've been sledding with my kids out and about, and I'm just, I'm drenched. You know, I'm just drenched in sweat. And it's weird because, I don't know about you guys, but I'm never really thirsty when it, in the, in the wintertime. I don't know what it is. But I know I've sweated quite a bit, and I know I need to drink some water, right? Okay. So be aware of wet and windy conditions, things like that. So common sense, just because you can doesn't mean you should. I thought this was pretty creative on their part. Um, I don't know if they got the job done, but it's pretty scary. And so now that we've gone through a couple of these items, I just kind of want to give you guys a safety detective test and see how well we can do. Can you guys see or find any of the, the, the safety exposures and solutions to those in this picture? You can just yell them out. Eye protection for sandals. No fence guard. Anything else? <laughs> the guy's not wearing any safety glasses either. Um, you have a discharge here for the dust collection, and there's a bunch of debris and material. So when he goes to cut that, he's going to create a, a dust plume. So we want to make sure that has dust protection. Um, we got a, It's kind of hard to see, but over here is a cord. So we've got a slip, trip, and fall over here. And one thing with the rags, uh, it's more of a, a flammability exposure, but if, if a lot of your woodworking shops, they have uh, solvents, paints, things like that, the rags, um, try to make sure that those get into UL listed, uh, three, uh, yeah, 300 UL listed safety cans where they have the closing lid on top. Uh, I've been in too many schools where they're just tossing them into the garbage can and you can have spontane spontaneous combustion in those garbage cans, you have a fire. So try to reiterate to a lot of your shop uh, teachers to make sure that those get into the proper containers so we, we reduce that risk. And you might, I get some pushback, well, th it's all just water-based stuff. Well, I'd rather go above and beyond. You know, I understand it's water-based and, and the likelihood of spontaneous combustion is probably a little bit less, but we ought to take that extra step in protecting those areas. So how about this one? I know it isn't a school or anything, but just something to think about. What do you guys see? Right? So this area here is, is specifically desi designated for where these people should be walking. It's a safe zone. Anything else, guys? Yeah, he's, he's, he doesn't have his load low enough where he could see. He's looking around the corner of it. So his load should be lower. So he can see he's not using the mirror. They're not paying attention to what they're doing, right? The ladder probably isn't in the best spot. That shouldn't be. And so at least they have a mirror up to, to um, give an idea of who's around the corner, that kind of thing. How about this one, his kitchen exposure? No gloves, right? And you can't see it, but there's actually steam coming out of this. So he's going to grab that. It's going to be hot. He's going to drop it. You know, we're going to have slip and fall exposure, burn exposure, things like that. What's wrong with his posture? Look how he's reaching. His foot is, looks like it's in front of the door. So he's, he's taking this, his reaching action where it, it needs to be close and needs to be under control. You know, his feet need to be right where they should be planted, you know. And so his posture is not right. We have some boxes of material against electrical panel. That needs to be removed, right? How about some chemicals and some rags next to all the food? You know, I got some exposures there, right? Slips and falls. I don't know what this is, but if he walks around, this is sticking out. That's a slip fall exposure, kicking that, that kind of thing. Can't really think of any, see anything else there, but. So think safety first, you know, it's always a big one. And uh, this gentleman, very, I, I thought that was a two by four, but it looks like a stick. <laughs> I don't know. It looks a little scary. And this guy, 
That's pretty creative. Nice, there he's at least using two by four. And then, hey, they're, they're controlling the heat exposure. <laughs> right? Keep them cool, that's for sure. Who's seen, have we seen that in a break room? <laughs> And then some more exposures where a wooden ladder, you got this little bitty chain controlling this. And then you have a fall expo where I don't know what's in this bucket. These guys should have hard hats on, um, electrical exposure with the ladders and the electrical lines, things like that. So in conclusion, really identifying hazards really isn't enough. They ought to be evaluated. And then once they're evaluated, come up with a plan or a course of action to control that. And knowledge is everything. Practice at home. And what I mean by that is take this information and utilize it at home. Um, I, I've gone into some facility, um, maybe a machine shop, and I've talked about mowing safety. And they'll say, why are we talking about this? We don't even mow here at the facility. And I said, well, here's the thing. You mow at home, right? So if you get hurt at home, it affects the company because now you can't go to work. So now the company has to find someone else to do, and I've seen this, where uh, you, have a, you have a particular person got hurt at home, he can't go to work, so the owner says, hey, Bob, can you go and do this? Bob isn't used to the manual labor that your other guy was doing, and now Bob gets hurt, you know, because he's not used to having to lift 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 40 pounds. He pulls out his back, and so it just, it's kind of a wicked cycle, so... Try to take a lot of this stuff at home. If you have any kind of safety meetings in your facility, don't shy away from home safety. You know, I, I had a, one company that bought fire extinguishers for all of their uh, employees to take home. You know, I thought it was a great philosophy. So, any questions, concerns, anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, when, it, when it comes to the, the, the slips and falls, a lot of that is, is just taking the action when you see it happening. So too many people just walk by the exposure. It doesn't mean they're being malicious or they don't care about that. It's just I think we're all so busy trying to get the next thing done that we forget to correct the, the, the thing that happened. And some people think that's not my job. And so that's not, I'm not going to clean up that spoke because that's not my job and so that kind of thing. So I, if, if you can help your facility to create more of a safety culture and everybody's kind of watching each other's back, that goes a long way in, in preventing those types of slips and falls and, and type of things. So um, great question. Great question. But that's it for me. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Be safe out there.